myself and Pastor Anne, we want to extend such a warm welcome to each of you. We're glad you're here today. This morning, we are uh, wrestling with kind of a challenging text. And maybe you've heard this one before, but it's essentially to the people in the book of Revelation. And the, the statement is that, we are, that you are lukewarm, and therefore I'll spit you out of my mouth. Not a real fun text for Sunday. But I think there's something beautiful in it, in our reality in our world today, that sometimes we use scripture out of context to prove our points, rather than using scripture as the basis for how we have conversation. So if you have a Bible, I'm going to invite you during the sermon to open to Revelation 3. If you don't have one, located in front of you are little pew Bibles throughout, kind of scattered throughout the chairs. You can take a look because this is kind of a weird letter uh, to the people of Laodice Laodicea. I better get that right today. And so check that out, Revelation 3, as a chance to kind of think about how God might be inviting us to think about Scripture a little different. It is also an invitation for us to think faithfully about how do we read Scripture in light of our world? How do we hear both message of challenge and sometimes correction in this day and age? It's a big question. Well, this morning we have just a couple of announcements before we begin worship, uh, and we'll draw your attention to those. Our first one is, uh, this morning we are kind of commissioning our uh, group of people to go out and serve communion to our homebound um, ministry, and so you'll see that as part of our worship service this morning. Some of our kits are up here, some are with people as they've already gone out. Um, and so if you have an interest in bringing communion to people once a month, let us know. It is a beautiful ministry that happens on a monthly basis here at American Lutheran. Our second one, we don't have a slide for. Uh, just a, a friendly reminder, July 4th, the office will be closed here at American Lutheran in observance of the holiday. And then our third one, Pastor Ann will talk about. So you know that it rained last week, right? And as the floodwaters rose um, in various ways throughout our region, um, and then we knew the rain was stopping, and there was a question about whether or not people were going to need help. And so uh, there was a flyer that went around on Facebook put out by Suzanne Murphy and Lisa Schutte. And they were going to have a rummage sale and then hospice was going to have a rummage sale. And they decided to switch their focus so that, um, so that their, we, we would just collect goods for flood relief. I um, have lived in flooded areas before and ministeriums also often step up to the plate. So I called an impromptu meeting of the ministerium. Last Tuesday we met here down in our gathering space. Uh, Radio Works came, Suzanne and Lisa came, and we had 17 different leaders. So that means that there were 15 of the American Lutheran churches, uh, 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 Worthington churches represented and we decided to become a leadership team and that our immediate response was to collect uh, cleaning items and personal care items. And so we have delivered to Heron Lake, uh, Rock Valley, we took a 26 foot uh, trailer filled with cleaning supplies to Rock Valley, um, Spencer, and there's one other town and it's slipping my mind right now. We are collecting and those items are really needed. Seriously, they are needed. Um, shampoo, deodorant, conditioner. We don't need toothbrushes and toothpaste. We had a dentist in Adrian who gave us hundreds. And then JBS gave us 700. So we'll have clean teeth. But what we won't have is clean hair and, and uh, stuff to do flood mitigation. So that's phase one. That leadership team, Neighbors Helping Neighbors, there is a Facebook page that I created for this. It's, there are a lot of Facebook pages called Neighbors um, Helping Neighbors and I didn't 
know how to make it Worthington specific. So you have to dig for it. There's a little circle. It's white, orange, and blue. Neighbors helping neighbors. Look for it. If you could like us and follow us, we post stuff from Jackson and Nobles County and all around the area. Um, we're moving into phase two now this Tuesday. The leadership team is meeting here again. And we are going to begin the collecting of furniture and clothing and home items. Many people have lost their entire homes, particularly in Rock Valley and Rock Rapids. Um, we still aren't hearing much from Jackson and Wyndham. They're still assessing as water just goes down. The other immediate need is going to be for groups of people that are willing to go and help clean basements. And I know that there are you, members, you here with us today, that um, have water in your basement, you've had to take out sheetrock or you need to take out sheetrock. You can, if you want our help, you can talk with me or you can talk with Suzanne, you can talk with Pastor Jeremy, and we will do our best to help you or get someone over to help you, okay? If you know of neighbors that need help, please, uh, you can text me, it's the best way. Pa text Pastor Jeremy, because um, we're in it for the long haul. That's what the ministerium said. We're in it for the long haul. So, yeah. you will see in the gathering space, some of the collected flood items. Those will be moved out uh, to the fairgrounds, uh, into the building where they normally have um, food. The 4-H folks have decided because they could not get volunteers for to serve a meal or to serve goodies um, during the 4-H at the fair. Um, that building will be vacant and that's where we will be working out of this next week. And so if you want to donate items or if you have cleaning supplies or things that you're willing to help kind of uh, do mitigation for homes, um, you can either drop them off here at American Lutheran. We'll leave those tables up in the gathering space um, or we can give you exact directions to the fairgrounds where those will be housed as well. So. And if you are more comfortable um, giving cash, um, you can, I don't want to speak for Sandy, but if you are going to give through, and want to get a, uh, it's a larger sum and you want to give it through church, we'll have to talk about that because it, it gets complicated. We're, um, I know that, I'm looking at Greg Ramo, um, from what I've heard, uh, Living Waters Covenant, where Chris and John Stewart are pastors, their accountant and bookkeeping is willing to do it. So if you, if you, just talk to me personally if you want to make a cash donation that's larger. If it's like $25, $30, we'll just go shopping. So thank you. The beauty of this is it's a community helping other communities, and that's what church really is. It's a, our way of being hands and feet to those in need. So thank you for the ways that you've already done the work, and thank you for the ways that you continue to do the work. As more of those things come our way, we're gonna to continue to let you know um, and be a community and church together. So thank you. That as well, the other thing I wanna draw your attention to is up front here, um, we have flowers from Don Haugen's funeral on Friday and then Milt Jorgensen's funeral on Thursday. It was a busy week at American Lutheran. And so we walk alongside our friends and family in their grief as well. So with that this morning, I'm gonna invite you to stand as you are able and comfortable as we begin with worship. inviting us always to risk the unknown. We gather in the name of Christ, fully human, fully divine, full of mystery. We gather in the name of the Spirit, unveiling for us what feels long hidden. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you all. Please take a moment to share that peace with your friends and neighbors alike.
We give you thanks, O God, for the gift of baptism, for this water, crisp and cold, inviting us to shake off the cobwebs of all that we had thought to be true. We give you thanks, O God, for the gift of baptism, for this water, warm and inviting, reminding us of your comfort and embrace. We give you thanks, O God, for the gift of baptism, for lakes and rivers, oceans and creeks, for the waters that foam and rage, and for those that drip and trickle, for waters that teem with life. We give you thanks, O God, for the gift of baptism, for waters that hide dangers yet unknown, for waters that remind us to be born anew, for all the waters across your wide creation. We give you thanks, O God, for the gift of baptism. Alleluia. Amen. O oh God, your promise to sustain all of creation sparkles like sunlight on clear river water. Give us courage to look toward your unveiling, that we might participate alongside you in works of justice for the whole world. Amen. Our scripture story comes from Revelation, the third chapter. I know your works. You are neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were either cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. Holy wisdom, holy word. Thanks be to God. Well, grace, mercy, and peace to you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. 
Well, the Danish uh, folktale author Hans Christian Andersen published a story called The Emperor's New Clothes. Does anybody remember this one? In 1837, and I think sometimes that stories that are written years and years ago still have a good foundation in how we think about faith today. So this is one that I think if you heard this text, you might kind of wonder, well, hot, cold, lukewarm, so what? right? How do I think about faith in light of things that happen? And so I thought this morning I'd begin with this uh, beautiful folktale and kind of help us remember the story a little bit if it's a little unfamiliar. And so this story begins with two swindlers who arrive in the capital city with an emperor who is obsessed with abundance, especially his clothes. The swindlers come up with a scheme that the way that we're going to draw this in is they pose as traveling weavers in a meeting with the emperor, they decide to weave him some magnificently magical clothing. See, the magic of these garments is that they are invisible to anyone who is foolish or incompetent. Let's see how this goes. So the emperor excitedly hires them and they go about their work. Various officials and even the emperor himself go to see the progress quite often, and they see empty looms, and they see uh, this spindle of things with nothing on it, but it's moving. And so the emperor assumes that, well, I don't want to be foolish, so I'm not going to do anything to help anybody. I'm not going to say anything because I don't want to seem foolish or incompetent myself. Yet this emperor sees and admires the beautiful garments as they're in front of him. So finally, the weavers send word that the emperor's suit is completed. So the emperor arrives, removes his clothes, and they mime dressing the emperor, commenting on all of the beautiful colors, and it's so great that you can see these things. And this emperor sets off in a royal march across the city in his magical new clothes. Initially, everybody goes along with this charade because why not? They don't want to seem foolish or as if they're missing something that this emperor might have himself. Everything goes according to plan until a young child simply says, but he's got nothing on. You can imagine how the rest of the story goes, that everyone starts laughing until they realize the emperor has been duped, that the emperor has nothing on. In our passage today, we're talking about this church in Laodicea, this collective that reminds us, similar to these, this story of the emperor with no clothes, that these are people who are missing the truth right in front of them. And Jesus firmly reminds them that the church, in reality, that they've got nothing on, that they're missing something important. And so to kind of back us up a little bit, if you are familiar with the Re book of Revelation, it's full of really powerful images. It's got a lot of things that leave us wondering. And I will tell you this, and I've told people in, at American Luther's, Lutheran, this book is part of the reason I wanted to learn to study scripture. Because I always heard people say, this is exactly what this means. And I can tell you after years of wrestling with it, with talking with professors, taking courses, I am no smarter today than I was years ago because the images are powerful. They're challenging. They leave us wondering with what might God be doing in this story. And it comes, this whole book is written from the book of John, or a vision of John, a revelation, if you will. It's a dream of he seeing something happening in the world. And instead of finding a way to just simply say, something is wrong, deal with it, he invites us into story, to images so powerful and so relatable that they would have moved someone to something new. This vision of John was written to very specific people in very specific towns. And so today we're talking about one of those. The town is called Laodicea. And it begins with this text. I know your works. You're neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were either cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. Sounds kind of interesting. But what's going on behind the curtain? What's going on in this story? 
You see Laodicea is a city in Phrygia. It's home to one of the seven churches. So if you look at that uh, chapter 3 in Revelation, you'll begin to see a letter to each of these churches in Asia. But this one is where we're held today because Laodicea was a city known for its wealth. It's beautiful, opulent, extravagant nature. It was known for having tons of things and really missing the point. Because the problem was for Laodicea that Laodicea had all the money and the power and the wealth in the world, but they had a water problem. So for a moment, think if you will, a modern day Flint, Michigan. We know how that story goes. We've heard it in the news over the years. It's a beautiful city that had some interesting things happening. On one side of the city, you had water coming from the beautiful mountains, cold, fresh, beautiful water. And on the other side of the city was a pipeline coming in that came from the hot springs down in the valley. Each of these sources of water flowed together. And they ran together through a set of pipes called an aqueduct, which you see pieces of in front of you there. And that aqueduct flowed to a common well. Anybody who's been around long enough knows that what happens when you mix really good, clean mountain water, and if you've ever had really hot water before, and they run together, what happens? You get lukewarm water. Catch the lukewarm in the text? That it's happening that you're neither hot nor cold, because hot and cold we can handle, but when those two streams run together, you get really gross, lukewarm, calcium-rich water that is, tastes kind of like chalk. You begin to see this image coming to life, I hope, that what happens when you drink those types of things, if you've ever had a cup of coffee that you've left out too long, and you go to take that drink of coffee and it's cold, kind of gross, or if you've ever left your water bottle in a car on a summer day, and you go to take a swig of that water, and it's just hot. If you see a few grimacing faces, you kind of know where this is like, right? This image is what people drank every day. And so it was so gross, in fact, that it just made them want to spit this water out. It's kind of a disgusting image. But for all the wealth and for all the power, the people of Laodicea couldn't fix the problem. They were stuck with water that was simply lukewarm. And for those of us that wrestle with these kind of questions or that wonder about this, we're left with some curiosities, I hope. I think as Christians, we've heard this phrase a few times, that you must, be not, or you must not be lukewarm in your faith. That either you're really hot or you're really cold. Either you're on fire for Christ or you're left in the trenches. And that leaves us with a wondering what God might be doing. How is God inviting us as people of faith to think about our own stories? Because it's not necessarily a term of ambivalence towards faith or disinterest, but maybe there's something that helps us think a little different. Maybe if we drink a little bit fresh water, we have a different taste in our mouth of faith. You see, one of the beautiful things about the book of Revelation is that the author knew how to connect with our everyday story. And the term used in this is apocalyptic literature, literature that talks about the end times, because it peels back the curtain on what is happening. It helps us see something with new eyes, with a new vision. And I wonder, as people of faith, how we think about God's story in our world today. I hope when we read texts like these, we begin to question what we hear in our world. I don't know if anybody had a chance to listen to the news or watch debates or listen to the stories over the last several months. There are people that predicted the end times because of the flood and rock rapids. There are people that have misquoted scripture about whatever political agenda or political conversation is out there. They've used scripture in pieces to tell a part of God's story. And if it makes you a little uncomfortable, unsettled, this is what the author's trying to get us to see. Can you imagine, as people of faith, if you received a letter in your mailbox today that said, you're simply lukewarm and I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. This is God's word for each of you. 
Does it feel good? Does it leave you with hope, encouragement? Does it leave you unsettled? Because for the people of Laodicea, they would have received this letter from John and they immediately would have recognized the taste of their water. That lukewarm is what they would have experienced. That imagery connected to who they are as people of faith. So when I was a kid, I ended up at a Bible camp kind of very early on, and one of the speakers that was there for that camp talked about this very text at length for an entire weekend to a group of teens. Lukewarm Christians aren't worth the time of day. If you aren't on fire for Jesus, then you're not doing anything worthwhile. I think sometimes we wonder, or I did as a kid, about how do I be on fire for Christ? What does it mean to be hot or cold? Because sometimes I live my faith quietly, and sometimes I live my faith out loud. But I don't always know which one is the right one if this is the way we see this text. So I challenge you, and I want to invite you, to hear the words of Jesus as something else. Not as a corrective for hot or cold, but a way that we corrode the message of Christ. Think our news, think our politics, think the ways that you have heard scripture used as a weapon or as a tool, and the ways in which it has come out to prove a point about something that we should agree with. And I wonder if we aren't asked about something different. You see, I wonder if we are called not to simply say it's a yes and no, but how is this true to the gospel being proclaimed in a world today? A gospel that brings bags of clothing and supplies to a community in need. How do we become people of faith living out loud? It isn't about being enthusiastic for a certain way of thinking, but it's about not corroding like the water pipes of God's people. How do we use scripture as its whole entity, its whole story, to tell the truth of the way God moves and lives and loves in our world? How do we not corrode our own water supply? Because power and wealth can't fix a broken water supply, but they can move us in a way to care for our neighbor, to love deeply. So here's the, the reality, I think, for the people of Laodicea and the truth of the gospel being proclaimed. If you've ever lived something in one way your entire life, I am sure that it feels uncomfortable to do something new. So many have heard the story of the grandmother's pan of ham, where grandma cut the ends off of each side of the ham to stick it in the oven. And then the daughter did it, and the granddaughter did it, and the granddaughter finally said, Grandma, why do we cut the ends of, off the pan? And Grandma kind of beautifully remarked, I did it because the pan I had was too small. We pass on faith from generation to generation. We act and we cut the ends off some of our faith stories because they're uncomfortable or because it doesn't meet our agenda or our hopes or our wishes. And God invites us deeper still to wonder aloud, what does it mean to live a faith that is full, that is rich, that is filled with meaning, that is both beautiful and corrective in the same breath? Because I think sometimes we don't like hearing hard messages. We don't like being confronted with our own stories when it doesn't feel easy. Or we've heard this story over and over, and so we assume that there's only one way to see God at work. Our invitation is to wonder in a broader way, what is God up to? So I invite you, as you think about this story, to go home today or to pull it up on your phones or open the Bibles in your pews and read the story from Revelation 3 to find where God is moving even in the beautiful and the corrective, in the way that God's people need to hear an honest truth and be comforted. So let's be honest, this is the morning that I'm guessing most of you are feeling a little bit uncomfortable with a text like this. What do I do with it? How do I live it out loud? 
in many ways as people of faith, if you've only heard the small piece of the text, you're living like an emperor with no clothes. We miss the beauty that comes after it. And the part of the text that we omitted today, kind of on purpose, it's part of the, the book we're using, misses God's next thing. At the end of the text, Revelations 3, 19, 20, the end of the letter to the people of Laodicea, to those I'm, whom I love, rebuke and discipline. So be earnest and repent. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. God's word is a corrective, but God's word is also an invitation. There is a word and a message of hope. You see, I think if we hear these texts and they make us comfortable every time, if we come to church and all we hear is a warm, fuzzy message every Sunday, we're probably missing some of what God is doing. But God has an invitation to step out, to step deeper, to wander anew with one another. Where is God's big story unfolding? I think it's an opportunity to, to confront a couple of things. We use scripture often to coerce agreement that we all have the same opinion. And I think God is also inviting us to confront things so we can be authentic. How do we hear God in our own story coming out? How am I living a faith that doesn't corrode God's gospel, but lives it fully? How do we think about our faith as a people of God? I love being a Lutheran. I have been a Lutheran most of my childhood, most of my life, and I love it because Luther is always in this mindset of reforming God's church, of moving us from agreement with the world to a truth and centered gospel. It's about finding our authentic selves and finding the way that God moves in us. It's an invitation to come against power and politics so that we might anchor ourselves in the truth of who Jesus is, a faith that grounds us in the gospel. It's the hard work of being church together, and it's the hard work of being honest about our faith. And in that, that is where God's inviting us to hot and cold and lukewarm together. And so as you think about your faith and where God is inviting you, I want to invite you into a question today as part of our reflection time together. Where are you hearing the gospel corroded? Where do you hear the gospel come out in, in the world today? And you wonder, is that the whole thing? And so just a moment, we're going to invite you into that question. Uh, Sylvia, I think, will hold up the prompt. Is where do you see lukewarm things in our world today? So ponder that. And as we do, we'll begin with a time of reflection. You can talk to your neighbor if you wish. Uh, think to yourselves, and then we'll enter into our song.
I invite you to stand in body and spirit as you would like and let us profess our faith in God. We are gods. We belong to the one who creates all things in whose image all people are made. We are Christ's. He has loved us, healed us, called us, and anointed us with his spirit. We belong to God's death and resurrection and ministry. We are the spirits. We belong to the church, the body of Christ. God gives us the gifts of forgiveness, resurrection, eternal life, and the gift of participating in the healing of the world by God's grace. As God's beloved, we devote ourselves to God, holy, joyfully, and with the help of Christ. Amen. I ask that you ground yourselves, let the Holy Spirit fill you as we join together in prayer. We are a people, one, the communion of saints, and in the power of the Spirit, we join together with God. God of abundance, you fill your church, your beloved community with a multitude of gifts. Sustain those among us who feel that they are not valued. Open our hearts to the wondrous breath of all who call upon your name. Equip us to reach out with gentleness and hope so that all may feel they belong. In your mercy, hear our prayer. God of creation, your goodness abounds. You are now multiplying the fruits of the earth and you also help us to rescue it from our wastefulness. We are mindful that many in our region are experiencing the devastation from the recent rains. Homes have been acted, uh, impacted and building and businesses. Livelihoods have been changed. There's lots of decisions. There's much paperwork. There's wondering about the future that many are being initiated into. We know that you are near. And so we ask that you move us through your spirit as your beloved community to continue to love our neighbors. In your mercy. God of justice, you reign in steadfast love. Bring peace among nations ravaged by war or strife. We pray for our own nation this morning as we prepare to celebrate our Independence Day. We are indeed a divided people. People who struggle to know what truth is real because much has been corroded in the name of political power. And so we ask for a kindness that could emerge so that we might listen and see each other again as neighbors rather than partisans. Illumine the paths of justice and freedom for those who lead them in your mercy. God of compassion, your touch brings healing and your word revives us for life. Hear our prayers for Ruth and John Rushi, for Macy Thier, Gerald Furstenberg, Cheryl Martins, and Donna Grant. Continue to be moving in the life of Mitchell Wagner and Montana Skolton, Ruth Weiland, Patrick Weiland, Buddy and Sylvia Richter, Noah Tellez, Joe Bauer, and Marilyn Kelly. Be with all who provide care for those we have named here in church and in our hearts, for doctors and nurses and healthcare workers who provide that care, Turn wailing into dancing and weeping into joy. In your mercy. God of community, 
You gather us at your table of plenty where there is hunger among us, open our hands. Where we are lukewarm to the needs of others, surprise us with open hearts. In your mercy, God of ages, great in your faithfulness, we remember in thanksgiving those beloveds who have died. We lift up the family and friends of Don Haugen and the family and friends of Milt Jorgensen, who now have joined with all the saints who sing without ceasing in your heavenly glory. Holy God, holy and merciful, into your outstretched arms we commend ourselves and for all for whom we pray trusting in the one who is the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. I invite you to be seated, and the ushers are going to come forward to collect your gifts of tithes and offerings. pray. God of every good thing, you, you provide, provide for us in every season of our lives. lives. Help, Help us to open our hands, open our lives to your whole creation, creation that, that we might prioritize justice over wealth, truth over reputation, and people over prophets. Amen. Amen. is with us here. In this bread there is healing. In this cup is life forever. In this moment by the Spirit Christ is with us here. Eternal God, our Creator, in you we live and, and move and, and have our being. Look, look upon us, your children, the work of your hands. Forgive us all our offenses and cleanse us from proud thoughts and empty desires. By your grace, draw us near to you, our refuge and our strength. 
In this meal, Christ meets us. We are a people fed and forgiven, claimed through the waters of baptism into the promise of new life. Christ is here, and for that we rejoice for the grace we have received. Here is grace, here is peace. Christ is with us, he is with us. Know his grace, find his peace. Feast on Jesus here. In this bread, there is healing. In this cup is life forever. In this moment, by the Spirit, Christ is with us here. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, he gave thanks, and he broke it. And he gave it to the disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Again, after supper, Jesus took the cup. He gave thanks and he gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people, for, for the forgiveness of sin. Do this in remembrance of me. Please stand as you are comfortable. Here we are, joined in one. Christ is with us, He is with us. We'll proclaim till He comes, Jesus crucified. In this bread, there is healing. In this cup is life forever. In this moment, by the Spirit, Christ is with us here. We're gathered into one by the Holy Spirit. We pray the prayer that Jesus is teaching us to pray. Our, Our Father, Father in heaven, in hallowed, hallowed be your name. Your, your kingdom, kingdom come, come, your will be done. Be done on earth, earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. In a moment or two, our ushers will direct you forward to one of two stations. At each station, there is a, a wheat wafer as well as a gluten-free wafer in a small white or glass bowl. If you need that, please reach in and take your wafer. There is dark wine and then there is light grape juice. Please indicate to your server what you need if you need help or you may take the cup for yourself as you receive the words of for you from Jesus. If you would like us to bring you communion, indicate that to your usher and we will gladly do that. This here, this table has been set for you. You who are seeking and you who rest in the illusion that you have all the answers. You who speak up in the face of injustice and you who struggle to find your voice. You who understand that we are both and saint and sinner from the beginning to the end. So now come because Jesus invites you. At this time, I'll call our uh, table servers forward.
Guys, now may the body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in God's grace. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. O oh God, you have fed us with this meal beyond our imaginations, a meal of grace and delight and freedom. Send us forth... And then now let us pray for those who are visiting in the home and sharing Christ's body and blood. Gracious God, loving all your family with the mother's tender care, as you sent the angel to feed Elijah with heavenly bread, assist us in this ministry on which we are sent forth. In your love and care, nourish and strengthen those to whom we bring this sacrament that through the body and blood of your Son, all the comfort of your abiding presence. Before I give the sending blessing, I just want to invite all of you to head into the fellowship hall where there's donuts and rolls and coffee and kinship. If you see someone you'd like to visit with and their table is full, well, just tap them on the shoulder and pull a chair over. Um, the tables are set with six chairs each, but we can get more than six around a table. So leave open spaces and invite others in. May God bless you with curiosity to continue growing into yourself. May God keep you steady in the face of all that is unknown. May God shine face shine on you and as you seek the answers to old questions being brought into new life. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Spirit, Amen. We sing our sending song. peace with open hearts and minds, seeking justice and truth in all things. 
We will. Thanks be to God.